Our text today is from Jeremiah in the first chapter. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest out of the womb, I set thee aside. Today I'd like to begin with you a study of the prophecy of Jeremiah. It is a companion piece to the books of Kings. The book of Kings gave you the bare historical detail of the destruction of Jerusalem. But countries do not collapse and die. People do. Jeremiah gives you the human and personal side of those last times. He lived at that critical period and lets us in on what was going on in the hearts and minds and lives of people who had gone astray from God. Now, if you can picture a map of Palestine in your mind, you know that it was at the crossroad of three continents. Asia, Africa, and Europe. The tiny principality of Judah also lay in the crossfire of three mighty nations in ferment. Egypt to the south, Assyria to the north, and Babylon due east across the desert. It should not surprise you that God will intervene in the affairs of men but it may surprise you where God does it. He bypasses the palace of Pharaoh at Memphis on the Nile, bypasses the mighty citadel of Nineveh in the north. He bypasses fabled Babylon out on the banks of the Euphrates River. And he begins the drama in the tiny village of Anathol, about three miles northeast of Jerusalem. Now, that's not a promising place to begin, but you could say the same thing of Anathol that you sing about Bethlehem. Oh, little town of Anathol, how still we see thee lie. In Anathol, the exiled priests of Israel and their families took refuge. And to one of them, a son was born by the name of Jeremiah, a name which means God hurled. Jeremiah grew up near enough to Jerusalem to know something about the big city and also far away enough to remain an unsophisticated country boy. And from the fathers of his village, Jeremiah learned the history of Israel, the grand old traditions that were gone but not forgotten, and the Stories of so many men and women of outstanding faith. But nothing, not his parental influence, not his family background, not current events, could have prepared Jeremiah for the turn that his life was about to take. He tells it, the story of himself and says, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest out of the room, I set thee aside. I have ordained thee a prophet to the nation. Jeremiah does not tell us how the word of the Lord came to him. The Holy Spirit does not seem to use any fixed pattern when he breaks into the lives of people. The call came to Moses when he was feeding the flocks 
out there on the back side of the desert. And the call came to Isaiah when he was in the temple and caught a vision of a throne high and lifted up and a seven-winged seraphim singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And to Amos, who was not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet, but a herdsman in the hill country of Tekoa, when the call came, taking them away from his flocks and herds. Jeremiah is called directly by God. The Holy Spirit wrestles with this man's spirit and convinces him that there's nothing else that he can do. Now, people, all of the prophets had this one thing in common. One luminous moment in their lives when they were convinced that God had broken in upon them and God was calling them to do something they didn't want to do but couldn't help but do it. That's a far cry from how you get preachers today by the assembly line process where candidates for the ministry are processed through the system and then congregations call them by filling out an application form like it was some mail order catalog. And the Recruitment tactics, for which young boys are given pictures of beautiful campus settings and appeals are made to their self-interest and their ego and a free ticket to the good life. No, the rule of thumb used to be if there's anything else in the world that you can do, then do it. But if this calling is for you, it's because God won't let you, God won't let you do anything else. And Jeremiah was convinced that God had his life arranged before the night that his parents made love, before an ovum was fertilized in the soft lining of the uterus, before a fetus ever began to form within his mother's womb, before he leaped out into this dangerous world, through the painful contractions of labor. Wow! And what happens when he's convinced that God has called him? Well, he says, Oh, Lord God, I cannot speak, for I'm but a child. Now, that's not a very pretty picture of these hotshot prophets. But it is an accurate picture. That's the same thing Moses said. The same thing Isaiah said. The same thing Amos and Jonah said. The same thing the big fisherman of Galilee said to Jesus, quite bluntly, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. You must be mistaken, Lord. You've got the wrong guy, Lord. You don't know my inadequacy and my limitations, my lack of experience and my maturity. Jeremiah does not want to be pitched forth into a task he was totally unprepared for. He did not want to be hurled into the public arena in the most critical period of his country's history. 
But to complain of our inadequacies in face of the clear command of God, that's not modesty. That's an impertinence. That's disobedience. And so the Lord told them, Do not say unto me, I am but a child. I, you will go wherever I send you, and whatsoever I command you, you will speak. Be not afraid of their faith, for I am with you and will deliver you, says the Lord. Uh, Jeremiah was correct about something. If he were to go alone, on his own, his own strength and own ingenuity, it wouldn't work. Uh, better never to begin the journey. But it's my mission, the Lord tells him, not yours. My word you're going to speak, not your own. And I'm not going to promise you a rose garden or a trial and trouble-free life. But I will promise you this. I will be with you, and I will deliver you, says the Lord. And then the Lord stretched forth his hand and touched my mouth and said, I have put my words upon your lips. And I have set thee over kingdoms and powers this day to throw down and to root up, to destroy and to pull down and to build and to plant. Jeremiah felt that God literally, with his finger, touched his lips. Imagine, the hand that rules the world touches the mouth of this country boy. I have put my words in your mouth. Now that's what that imagery means. You are my spokesman. You are my mouthpiece. And that is the description of every preacher and prophet who ever lived. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. And Jeremiah's mission was twofold. Did you pick it? They had a plus side, negative side. Only in his case, the emphasis is on the negative. To root out and throw down, to pull down and destroy, and to build and to plant. And yet those two sides are true to all of life, aren't they? Before you can begin building it, You've got to clear away the debris, the rubble, and the obstacle off the building site. Before you can plant, you've got to clear the stone, and the brush, and the stump out of your field. Now, every building contractor and every farmer will tell you, he really doesn't like to clean enough. He much prefers the positive side, the building and planting for the future. And there's nothing wrong with that, as long as you remember there's always the negative side. To love one woman wholly means saying goodbye to all the other. To do one thing well means brushing off all the other distractions. To follow the road back to God means saying goodbye to all those other pleasant footpaths and roadways. Now, God deals with you and me just as he dealt with Jeremiah in this respect. He breaks into our lives without our deserving or without our doing. As he broke into the lives of the fishermen of Galilee who were washing their nets, they weren't thinking about this. And the woman of Samaria who one day went out to the well to draw water. And Nathaniel, 
standing there deep in thought, under a fig tree. And Saul of Tarsus on that hot and dusty road on his way to Damascus. So it, it could be in a sleeping infant here at the baptismal font. It could be in some dark moment of your life when you've got nowhere else to turn. It could be through the chance remark of some friend or co-worker. But this part is always true. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before you came forth from the womb, I set you apart. Now that means that God was back in eternity, and I can't even comprehend that concept. God was already planning for you, and thinking of you, and working his way down to you through all of the centuries to call you into being for this particular time and in this particular place. Now that's not always apparent to us. In moments of discouragement, we think that we were born in a long time. And boy, I could really prosper if I were somewhere else, another place. Somebody has compared God's plan to a richly woven tapestry. I don't know if you've seen them hanging on a wall. But from below, from our viewpoint, all we see are the tangled threads and the confusion of patterns. But from above and from God's viewpoint, he has woven a marvelous design with the thread of your life and mine. Now, if you can believe that, it's a great teaching, people. Ordinarily, you think of your coming into this world as well. A biological process. And that's the way we're taught. That's what the gynecologists and the obstetricians tell us. They prattle on about ovulation, fertilization, gestation, parturition. But you really believe it's more than that, because I've seen you. You hold a brand new baby cradled in your arms for the very first time. And you are overwhelmed by a sense of mystery. This, the personality, and this wee bit of a thing that is absolutely unique from all others in the earth. And you wonder to yourself, from what distant shore did this little voyager come? And you wonder, what destiny has God got planned for this little bugger? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you came forth from your mother's belly, I set you aside. Have you ever read the 139th Psalm? David thinks about where he came from. And he ends up saying, Such knowledge is so wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. But if you can believe that you began your journey in the heart of God back in eternity, you do not have to be afraid anymore of what time can bring. Most of us already know the right thing to do. But most of the time, what we need is the courage to do it. Because we're afraid of men's faces. Sneering looks. Contemptuous glances. Haughty countenances. As though these big shots gave us permission to live in this world. 
God gives you courage. Be not afraid of their faces. For I am with you, and I will deliver you, says the Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.